Welcome back. Um, we're going to talk about fuel systems. We'll start with the uh, system uh, overall um, and then we will also cover float carburetors on this video. Then I'll do a separate video for pressure carburetors and fuel injection. So we'll start with the whole system. Um, the system uh, consists of storage tanks. Um, sometimes there are a large number of those, sometimes it's just one. Uh, if there is a delivery system which consists of various lines and sumps and filters and pumps to get the fuel from the tanks to the engines. And then there has to be a fuel metering system that mixes the fuel with just the right amount of air so that we get combustion. We'll start with the onboard fuel storage system. Um, there's a lot of places we can put that. Um, we can put that in the wings on airplanes. Um, and I often do. That's the handiest place actually on the airplane to store it. We also have tanks in the fuselage uh, in various places down in the belly or uh, in the case of the R-22 behind the seats. Uh, there are a number of types of tanks that we can use. An integral tank is where you use the airframe itself um, and the skin uh, to form the tank. So instead of having a separate internal tank, you just seal up the skin and the, the ribs and use the wing to create the tank or the belly of the aircraft to create the tank. Um, another type the, which is used in the Cessnas is a metal tank that uh, uh, is inserted into a bay between ribs in the wing. And then a third type is a bladder tank, which uh, at this point I think have been installed on all the R-22s, and it's where you put a flexible tank uh, within a, a, a bay of some sort, either in a wing bay or, in the case of the R-22, behind the seats, you have a, a, a separate uh, fuel-proof bladder that the, the fuel is stored in. Then we have a fuel delivery system, and it consists of various lines. Um, some of them uh, stainless steel, some of them the appropriate type of rubber or neoprene or whatever. Um, it's nice to know the route if you can. Obviously, usually when you get on an airplane, you don't know exactly where the fuel flows. Uh, but if you have the opportunity to know where they lie, then that gives you the chance of telling somebody that where they are when they come out with the jaws of life to get you out of the wreckage. Um, fuel selector valves, uh, which direct the fuel from the tank to uh, whichever engine that you want the fuel to flow through. Um, the selector valves often have sumps attached to them to catch water or, or uh, impurities as it goes through. Uh, then we have pumps, either engine-driven pumps or electric. Um, there's even such a thing as a hydraulic pump and something called a jet pump, which we may talk about. And then there are sumps to catch water, screens, filters, and various other things to make sure that we're getting pure fuel. Here's an example of a fairly complex fuel system. Uh, and it has uh, some check valves and, and uh, selector valves and, and so forth in it. It's an example of how complicated it can get. Um, here's one from a Learjet, um, and this includes uh, some jet pumps and uh, includes uh, high and low pressure fuel lines. The reason we have high and low pressure fuel lines is because we use high pressure, low volume fuel to provide the motive force uh, to move large quantities of fuel at, low, at, at high volume. Here's an example of all sorts of fuel tanks that can be on an aircraft. Um, we have wing tanks, belly tanks, um, saddle tanks, tail tanks. Um, so there's all sorts of things we can do. And, and some aircraft are set up so that you the, the engines only draw out of one of the tanks. And so you actually have to move tank fuel from all of the other tanks into that tank in order to use it. This is a uh, diagram of the 152 um, and you can see that it's not maybe as simple as as you thought. Um, we've got lines that interconnect the two tanks um, so as a vent. Um, these tanks were originally only designed with one vent over here where it says number four. Um, 
they found that that didn't work in all cases and so now we have vented fuel caps out on the top as well um, the uh, f uh, and then we have lines running down to a selector valve we have lines running up to the primer so that we can prime the engine um, so there's lines kind of running around everywhere here's the uh, fuel tank out of the Robinson helicopter uh, we have a main tank and an aux tank, and they're interconnected so that initially you're drawing out of both tanks, and then uh, once you get down below the level of the bottom of the aux tank, you're drawing just out of the main tank. Once we get the fuel to the engine, we have to meter it. We have to mix the fuel with just the right amount of air, and it needs to be mixed in a way that it's broken up into fine little bits, and we call that atomization. The least expensive kind of, of fuel metering system is the float carburetor, and we're going to talk about that today. It's inexpensive relative to the other systems. It's fairly dependable. Um, and it's pretty easy to operate from a student point of view. The next step up from that is a pressure carburetor. Um, it uses a completely different principle. Um, uh, it gives you a little bit better efficiency, um, less prone to carburetor ice, uh, and it's more adaptable to inverted flight. And then there's fuel injection, which is even better f efficiency, and the chances of icing are slow, so low on fuel injection that we don't even bother to put carburetor heat on most of those systems. Float carburetors work on a, the Bernoulli's principle, um, as applied in a Venturi tube. So the Bernoulli principle simply states that if you have a volume of fluid, in this case, air um, flowing through a restriction at subsonic speeds. So this isn't a really super high speed. This is subsonic speeds. Um, as it goes through the restriction, uh, the, the air has to go faster in order to get through that part of the Venturi. Um, and because the total pressure has to stay the same throughout that Venturi, the static pressure decreases uh, while the dynamic pressure increases in order to have the same total pressure. And we take advantage of that low static pressure um, at the Venturi throat uh, to draw fuel in from a bowl. And so here's, here's the carburetor stripped down to its absolute basics here. We have a, a float chamber where f f fuel is stored and the, and the fuel level is just below the discharge jet level. And so if there's no air flowing, nothing's going to happen. The fuel's not going to flow. But if we have air flowing up into the engine, um, then it runs through this venturi and the static pressure decreases and it sucks fuel through that discharge jet uh, just like sucking soda up out of a straw. We use updraft carburetors in aviation for the most part. Uh, we do have downdraft carburetors in aviation, but uh, for the most part we use updraft carburetors. Um, the reason for that is if we flood the engine it makes it easier to unflood if the fuel can run back down out of the carburetor. So the air here is flowing from the bottom of the screen towards the top through the venturi causing the low pressure area and it's drawing fuel out of the float chamber. Um, so here's an example of the same principle. It's a, it's a straw and a cup of liquid. Um, and if, if we can introduce something called a bleed, air bleed system here, and it, and it improves the efficiency of our carburetor. Uh, and, the, and the mental experiment goes like this. We suck on the straw just with just enough suction to draw liquid one inch up into the straw. Um, if we put a pinhole here, um, the fluid now becomes easier to draw up because it's got the little bubbles helping it. If we run a little capillary tube down underneath the level of the fluid, um, then it puts a whole bunch of little bubbles in there and it makes it much easier to move the fluid up. And uh, it also has this added benefit of breaking the fluid into smaller chunks so we get it sort of pre-atomized -atom before it gets into the carburetor.
Um, and so rather than getting, than getting big globs of fuel like is shown here, we get the fuel broken up because we've added this air bleed system to the, to the uh, discharge nozzle. They also show here a main metering jet. So we have a very carefully sized orifice here, um, often called a jet, um, that uh, results in a very specific amount of fuel being drawn up to the discharge nozzle depending on how much air we're getting. So the more air flowing through, the lower the pressure area and the more fuel that we get and just the precise amount that we need works awesome as long as the level of the bowl is exactly right because if the level of the bowl were low then it would take more force to draw it up to the discharge needle so we need or the discharge nozzle so what we need is a, a mechanism for keeping that level exactly the same all the time in the bowl and we call that a float this works exactly like the float in the back of your toilet. Um, we have this float here, and the float is uh, is suspended on a little mechanism that is hinged here, so that when the float is lowered, um, the uh, uh, this needle here is drawn up out of a hole. So. Here's an example. The, the level of the float blow bowl has decreased. It draws the needle up out of the uh, fuel supply hole here, and the fuel is allowed to flow um, from the fuel tank um, or the fuel pump and refill the bowl, at which point it gets shut off. And that's where the float in float carburetor comes from, is this device right here. And so here we have a better drawing of the float carburetor. Um, we have the float here in the float chamber, um, and it's drawing up the needle, uh, and, the, and that allows fuel from the supply, whether it be gravity supply or a fuel pump, um, to refill the float chamber. We have the main metering jet here. We have the throttle open enough here so that we have enough airflow to draw fuel uh, into the discharge nozzle, nozzle where it can be atomized and drawn up into the engine. This little device here is called an economizer. An economizer opens up to allow additional fuel in only at high throttle settings. And what it's doing, we, we need a little bit richer mixture at high throttle settings because we we run the risk at high throttle settings of detonation. What we do to avoid detonation is we throw in a little bit of extra fuel that we know isn't going to get burned just to carry heat away from the uh, combustion chamber. So we richen the mixture just slightly. At an idle, we have a different problem. Um, there's not enough airflow through the venturi here to really draw the pressure down enough to draw fuel up through the main metering uh, discharge nozzle. Uh, and so, but what we do have is a source of very low manifold pressure, since the throttle is all the way closed, up here. Uh, and so that draws fuel through an alternate path that we call the idle mixture jet. Um, so at an idle, we're drawing fuel through a different path called the idle mixture jet jet. And uh, that only works at an idle. Once you start opening up the throttle, the manifold pressure increases and the, the idle mixture uh, doesn't work anymore. But we have adequate flow at that point to allow um, fuel to go out the main discharge nozzle. Mixture control is required in airplanes because we, we tend to fly at high altitudes and so we need to decrease the amount of fuel that we're putting in with the air because the air is less dense. There's several ways to do that. One is back suction where we just pull back a little bit on the float bowl chamber. Um, we reduce the pressure in the, the float chamber and that holds fuel back a little bit. Another is the airport where we just add extra air after the main discharge nozzle in order to lean the mixture out. And another is the needle or variable orifice um, that restricts the flow of fuel on its way to the main discharge nozzle. 
So here we have an example of a needle type mixture control system. Uh, and here's the needle we're talking about. Uh, if it's in the full rich position, it's drawn out of the hole enough so that the fuel can flow through unfettered. At that point, the mixture control jet is bigger than the main metering jet. But if we want to lean the mixture, we can insert that needle down into the hole and that becomes the choke point. That becomes smaller than the main metering jet. Uh, and therefore, we restrict the flow of fuel on the way to the discharge nozzle and we get a leaner mixture. A power enrichment system is something uh, that only works at full power. Um, if we need a little bit of extra fuel to soak up some heat at full power or high throttle settings, we throw in a little bit of extra fuel. Um, and we call it an economizer, which is a really horrible name. Um, I guess it, it's economizer because when it's not working, it saves you fuel. Um, there's just as many types of that as there are the mixture control. Uh, so we have needle, manifold pressure um, that operates a diaphragm or a piston. All of those uh, provide more fuel for cooling at high power settings. Here's an example of a needle type economizer. So when the throttle is moved towards the open position in this direction, it draws the needle up out of this hole and allows additional fuel in. Here's a cross section of a complete carburetor. Um, so we have the unregulated fuel pressure coming in from either gravity flow or a fuel pump. It goes in through the needle, uh, the, and then uh, which is controlled by the float. Uh, we have the needle type mixture control in this case here, controlling flow of fuel down into the, to the main pathway. Uh, and that leads to the discharge nozzle under normal circumstances. Uh, we also have a uh, needle type economizer here, uh, which opens up at high power settings to allow additional fuel in. And we have an accelerating pump over on the end here which any time you're moving the throttle from a low throttle setting to a more open throttle setting, we squirt a little extra fuel in uh, in order to compensate for the fact that you've just let a bunch of air in but not any fuel yet. So you need a little extra squirt of fuel as you're opening the throttle. Some people use that to prime their engine as they start it. It works if you're careful, but, um, but there's a real possibility that you're going to flood the engine that way and cause an intake fire. So um, we, we, uh, we actually stay away from that technique um, as a general rule in this program. Now if you're going to use a carburetor, a float carburetor, um, you're going to have to deal with carburetor ice. So we need to talk about that a little bit. Carburetor ice forms because of the evaporation of the fuel. Um, you'll find uh, textbooks that talk about the drop, of, drop in temperature due to the drop in pressure in the uh, Venturi, but that is incorrect. Um, the pressure and density, or the, the temperature and density remain constant through a Venturi. Um, only the pressure changes, um, only the static pressure. Uh, so uh, it's due to the evaporation of the fuel and all of the air that uh, we're bringing in has some moisture in it. And so the danger is that it freezes that moisture in the throat of the carburetor. It is a common causal factor for accidents and, and it's more common than the statistics show because um, a lot of engine failures happen and then of course the, the crash happens and then the ice melts and so it doesn't get uh, named as a cause. Um, so there's a lack of evidence. Most pilots that encounter carburetor ice say it never entered their mind that they would have carburetor ice given the conditions. The first symptoms of carburetor ice can be very easily dismissed. It's very slight drops in RPM or manifold pressure. Um, some pilots will take inappropriate actions such as adding only partial carburetor uh, heat or they pull the carb heat on and it makes the engine run slightly rough and so they push it right back in again. 
um, you want to pull it on and leave it on for uh, five or ten seconds um, because it'll run rough as the ice melts and then it'll clear up for you. Factors for formation are first and foremost moisture in the air. Um, second, the amount of fuel being evaporated because that's what's dropping the temperature. The ambient temperature, there's a range that favors uh, carburetor ice. Um, the amount of power that is being produced. Um, typically you're less likely to get it at higher power settings because there's more heat being produced by the engine so it tends to stay melted. These are the atmospheric conditions that it's most likely to accrete in um, and you can see it uh, covers a pretty broad range. Um, I, I would really like you to take a look at this chart in your reading and uh, uh, make sure that you understand just just what kind of range we're talking about here. So here's the ambient temperature and let's just to look at the red and uh, uh, orange part of this which are the uh, icing and serious icing uh, ranges. So uh, they start at about 25 degrees Fahrenheit and go all the way up to about 65 um, within these dew points and and these that range that combination describes about nine months out of the year in our area so carburetor ice is a real issue with us you really have to be aware of it it can and does form on nice sunny days because not all moisture is visible um, and also not all moist, the, the moisture is not consistent from sea level to your cruising altitude. The, there may, it may be quite a bit moisture at altitude, uh, but it doesn't really, it's not visible. It could be clear blue skies. Um, and it can happen even when it's pretty warm. I've had carburetor ice clear up into the 60s, um, and they say it can uh, happen all the way up uh, into the 80s. How we get rid of it is with carburetor heat. So here's a uh, carburetor and I've drawn in an air filter and the air coming in has some moisture in it and so ice starts to accrete on the inside of the uh, carburetor. Um, and this can get pretty bad. Um, so we add a system that goes and instead of taking air in through the filter it takes air from around the exhaust uh, manifold um, which is quite hot. Um, so I want to be clear here that we're not pulling exhaust in, but we're, we're pulling in air that's been heated by the exhaust. Uh, when you pull the carb heat knob, it twists this little plate here so that it pulls in air from the exhaust shroud instead of the air filter. After a second or two, it melts the ice. You'll get a little bit of a rough running engine for a few seconds, and then it'll smooth out again. Um, Symptoms of carburetor ice, very subtle at first, a little bit of reduced RPM if you're in a fixed pitch prop um, if you, um, or if you're in a uh, constant speed below the governing range, but that's unlikely. Um, if you have a manifold pressure gauge, you'll notice a reduced manifold pressure, um, but in the R22, the governor takes care of it for so fast you probably won't notice. Um, reduced EGT because the carb ice makes the mixture run a little bit richer. Um, and if you miss those, you'll start to get a little bit of engine roughness. And then eventually the engine quits. So how do you avoid that? Take action. So carb heat on full. If you have a carburetor air temperature gauge, you can experiment with partial carb heat settings. Otherwise, and we do have those in, all, in the R22, um, otherwise though you need to go either carb heat on or off. So we pull carb heat on full. Um, don't enrich in the mixture, um, at least not right away, um, because uh, the, the heat comes from the exhaust manifold and an enriched mixture means a cooler exhaust temperature. So you're, you're defeating your purpose here. Plus the uh, um, uh, the carburetor ice makes it run richer anyway. So just pull it on and wait for a few seconds. Um, expect that rough engine and don't let it scare you into pushing the carpet knob back in again. Um, that'll only last a few seconds and it's not going to kill your engine. 
after you know you had carburetor ice, then you know you're in the conditions that are it's going to form. So stay ahead of it. Um, uh, pull it on every couple minutes or every five minutes or 15 minutes, whatever you think is appropriate. Um, use full carb heat or none at all, um, unless your ca carburetor air temperature gauge equipped. Um, and then lean appropriately. If it is perfectly acceptable if you think that you're going to continue to form carb ice to just pull the carb heat on and leave it on. But if you're going to do that, you need to re-lean the engine because um, you run richer with the carb heat on. It's really critical that you make sure the system is working adequately during the run-up. Make sure that you get the RPM drop that is designated by your POH. Um, and while you're at it, um, leave it on for 5 to 10 seconds and pay attention and look for signs that you've cleared up the ice when you do that. Quite often, you'll pick up ice just going from the tie-down over to the run-up area. Um, so if you pay attention, you'll see it, and then you know you've got the conditions where you're going to have to worry about it. Remember, it's unfiltered air um, on most aircraft. Some of our R22s do have filters on the carb heat. Um, don't worry too much about the unfiltered air, though. If you need carb heat, use it. Um, watch for ice on the ground, too. Um, as you're taxiing around is a really probably the most common time to get carb ice. Um, so pay attention for that as you're taxiing around. Okay, that's it for float carburetors. Um, up next is pressure carburetors and fuel injection, which I will do in a separate video.